All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock. Uh, just about. It's 9.59, actually. Starting just a minute early. Now it's 10 o'clock, so good Tuesday morning. Um, a lot to review today. I know I say it every week, but uh, we've got some big headlines, as you know. Um, and uh, just good to see everybody. I see everybody kind of filing in. So um, we're going to follow our normal format. We're going to talk about IRA distribution issues from the uh, from the Ed Slack group. We're going to talk about the markets today. Markets, there's a lot to talk about today. Um, hopefully, hopefully, you've received my email about the SVB um, Silicon uh, Valley Bank issue. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, and, uh, inflation, inflation was a big one today too. So we'll talk about it. So let me just remind you, um, that, uh, to please, uh, it, you're watching this on YouTube, obviously, uh, if you haven't already hit the subscribe, like, and notification button, um, this there's, that does a couple things for you. First of all, it notifies you when, um, we have live videos or, or new videos are posted, and then um, it also allows you to comment. So I have it set where you've got to be a subscriber to be able to comment. So that just that just stops people from jumping on, making comments, jumping off. So um, uh, it also so it also allows you not just comments, but uh, also also um, questions. Thank you. Um, I just got word that sound and uh, video is good. Thank you. All right. So uh, today's financial planning topic, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to be um, Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks. We're going to talk about some of the differences between the two. Um, so this is going to be basic information, but it's good to review. Uh, you know, we just ended some classes in Villanova, as you know, and we're starting classes this week again in Holy Family University. And this uh, topic of 401ks, Roth 401ks and uh Roth IRAs is is always uh, there's always questions around it differences you know which are better and you know there's pros and cons of each and we'll go over them but um, Roth 401ks and Roth retirement plans in general are be going to be and already are more prevalent we saw some uh, significant changes in the Secure 2.0 <clears throat> Act that just came out, out excuse me <clears throat> in uh, February so um, there's very much a push from the legislature, the U.S. legislature, to push you into Roth um, type of retirement plans. And that's good for us as, as investors and as planners, for sure. So we're going to talk about that. If you're, if you're watching this on YouTube um, and uh, you, you uh, are watching the entire webinar, it, of course, is indexed. The recording is indexed, so you can jump right to the topic. Obviously, if you're watching live, you're going to have to listen to me to get to the financial planning topic or whatever section you like. But uh, the um, the recordings are indexed so that you can just uh, scroll down at the bottom of the page or scroll on the bar and it tells you exactly where um, I, there's a bar, you know, that runs kind of here. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to play that game. Um, the That tells you exactly when we talk about different topics. So um, upcoming events. So we I talked about uh, Holy Family University. So we have two, actually three series of classes. We have Thursday nights, which starts on the 16th of this week. Classes run from uh, 6.30 to 9.30, so we have uh, March 16th and March 23rd. Um, Tuesdays are, are March 21st and March 28th from 6.30 to 9.30, and then we do have a Saturday class on March 18th from 9 to 2. So you've all received an invitation to this class. Feel free to pass it on to someone you, um, you care about, uh, who you think may want to attend this class. Saturday is getting very, very full. We do have room on Thursday and Tuesday if somebody wants to jump in on those days. Uh, we have, um, we, we had Ed or, excuse me, we had David McKnight on a couple of weeks ago and, and you should have all received the recording of that webinar. Um, I, uh, I think it went very, very well. It was, um, it was certainly well received and Dave is using that, um, uh, repackaging that, that video over uh, a couple of weeks of his video series. So I appreciate that. We have Ed Slot and David McKnight, uh, joining us live in Newtown on May 16th. You all get invitations to that, um, and that's going to be at the wonderful Newtown Theater, and that will start at around 6 or 6.30. We're still working out that time. And I talked about the financial planning, uh, Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks we're going to talk about today, but let's jump into headlines. So we talked about SVB, the Silicon Valley 
uh, so yeah, Silicon Valley Bank and um, and other banks in general. And if you read my email I sent yesterday, you know th- this. There's going to be a lot of volatility in the markets for sure, and there's a lot of pressure on certain markets. SV SVB, from what we've been able to gather, and I, you know I didn't know about this bank until Friday, like many of you, but it was very very focused on um, the tech sector. We all know that the tech sector has been struggling. Um, but it seems like SVB's problem, just not unlike what Wachovia uh, went through, um, is that they made some bad decisions around their uh, interest rates and investments and whatnot. So um, so the good news is, although we lost SVB and was it Signature Bank um, over the weekend, it, it became very clear that the U.S. government will backstop, uh, come in and bra- backstop broad economic markets in the system. Again, so they stepped in during 2008, 2009. They, us, we stepped in during 2008, 2009, stepped in again during the COVID crisis. They're stepping in again to make sure that you're comfortable with your banking situation. Now, here's the thing, though. Uh, I was on with a client um, yesterday asking about this. You know, should I have, um, you know, they've got a significant amount of money in Wells Fargo. Should I have all my money in here? And, and you know, you should pay attention to the FDIC limits. So if you're concerned about the health of the bank, uh, you should pay attention to these limits. Um, you know, you can, and I was telling him, you could buy U.S. Treasury bonds right now, 90-day, uh, three-month U.S. Treasury bonds that are paying, um, you know, about 4.7, 4.8%. So there's not, there's zero risk there, you know, as long as, and this is not a recommendation, every situation is different, but there's, there's no risk there as long as you can hold those funds for that 90 day period. So if your concern is, Hey, I've got a million dollars in XYZ bank and it's only covered up to 250,000, um, you know, you can you can always if you don't need that other seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, you can always move it into U.S. Treasuries. If you need help with that, you can reach out to us. But um, there's a lot of ways to mitigate that. So we're, we can talk more about that. See that see how it unfolds over the next couple of weeks. But we'll pay attention to it and have this discussion continuing. This morning at eight thirty, I think it was um, the February Consumer Price Index number came out, and that's what we all refer to as inflation. Uh, and the estimate was 6% and it came out at 6%. So 6% is really awful, but it's good news for the markets as a whole um, because it's not higher than what was estimated. So that's good news. Down from January, remember January was 6.4%. Okay, so now let's, I'm going to share with you my screen here and we're going to go into the slot updates. I don't see any questions. Okay. So you should see here now uh, a little box with me and a, and my screen. So I always share these with you so you can follow along because there's a lot of text here. Uh, let me find my gosh darn cursor. I know it's here. All right. Um, all right. I'm right here. So this is by Ironburger. So you've all met Iron before. Uh, so these are the secure 2.0 glitches and unanswered questions. I really like this and um, I think it... It brings uh, into focus some areas that still have to be paid attention to um, with this Secure 2.0 law or act, um, and it's um, uh, it's it just goes to show you how legislation really works and how how these regulations have to unfold and uh, unintended consequences. So let's let's dig into it here. So, Ian wrote, writes considering that it made uh, 92 new IRA and retirement plan changes. Boy, that's a lot. 92 new IRA and retirement plan changes, and it's 357 pages long. It's not surprising that the new Secure 2.0 law has several unintended drafting errors and lots of unresolved questions. So I'm down here on the next paragraph. The drafting errors errors will have to be fixed either by Congress and technical corrections legislation or by the IRS. The first concern, the first concern is a delay in the age when RMDs, required minimum distributions, must start. The way Secure Act 2.0 uh, now reads is that someone born during 1959 will have two RMD ages, 73 and 75. So that's interesting. A second glitch has to do with the rule that higher income 401k participants must make 50 or over catch up contributions on a Roth basis starting in 2024. So that means that if you make over a certain level of income, the IRS is saying or the Congress is saying you must make those catch up contributions. 
that additional amount that you're allowed over the age 50 into the Roth option in your 401k. And Ian's going to talk about this a little bit more, but you heard me say when this first rolled out, but that not every plan has a Roth option. So does this mean that it's going to mean that all 401k plans and all retirement plans must have a Roth option? I hope so, but we'll have to see what Congress comes up with or what the IRS comes up with. So it's saying, let me read that sentence again. A second glitch has to do with the rule that higher income 401k participants must make 50 or over catch-up contributions on a Roth basis. And we're going to talk about what those are, those catch-up contributions later today. In making that change, Congress mistakenly took out an existing part of the tax code. The result is that no employees, higher income or not, will be able to make any catch-up contributions, pre-tax or Roth, starting in 2024. This is a, the, you know, a lot of people talked about, wow, it's such a pain. Some things are are um, active immediately. Some things are, are delayed until 24. Isn't it a good thing that this section was delayed until 2024? Or, you know, I'm over 50. I make a catch-up contribution. I would be very, very upset if I wasn't able to do that. My guess is that I, the IRS or Congress is going to resolve this one, certainly by the end of the year, probably most of these. Both of these must be corrected. Ian writes, there are, I'm here, starting here, there are several unclear issues concerning the the Secure 2.0 rule allowing 529 account owners starting in 2024 to roll over up to $35,000 of unused 529 funds to a Roth IRA. Great provision. To do the rollover, the 529 plan must have been open for more than 15 years, but Secure 2.0 isn't clear what happens when a 529 owner changes beneficiaries. So with a four, or excuse me, with the 529 plan, you can change beneficiaries really an unlimited amount of time. So as the owner of the 529 plan, you can designate who the beneficiaries are. So um, is the period that the 529 account was open for the prior beneficiary tacked on, or does a new 15-year period start fresh? 15 years is a long time. Also, does the $35,000 limit apply per 529 owner or per 529 beneficiary? Another great great question, because one owner, think about it, like the the owner of our children's 529 plans is my wife. So if she's the owner and there's four plans for exist for example 529 plans and they collectively have a hundred thousand dollars in them let's just say does that mean that she can roll over the unused portions per 529 account or does it mean is a thirty five thousand dollar limit collectively i don't know about that i mean obviously from a consumer point of view, an investor point of view, I'd like it to be individually, you know, per 529 account, as long as it's per beneficiary. That's what I mean uh, by 529 account. It could be per beneficiary, four kids, four beneficiaries. Can I now roll over that into a um, uh, uh, an IRA? And that would affect uh, a longstanding planning strategy we've always had where the parent can name themselves as beneficiary and then change it to the children as need it. But if 15 years starts every time there's a new beneficiary change, well, well that that plan, <laughs> that planning goes out the window. So, so Secure Act 2.0 ease the I'm here. Uh, Secure 2.0 ease the 10% early distribution penalty exception for certain public safety employees that it so so that it applies for distributions after 25 years of service, even if the distribution occurs before age 50. However, the law is unclear about whether the 25-year period must be with the same employer or whether prior service with another eligible employer can be used. As mentioned above, Beginning next year, certain high-paid 401k participants will be required to have age 50 or over catch-up contributions made to Roth accounts, but 401k Roth accounts are optional, not mandatory. This goes back to what I was talking about before. And Secure 2.0 doesn't say what happens if the plan doesn't already offer Roth accounts. Will the plan be required to start offering a Roth option? Can the plan continue not to offer Roth accounts, but in that case, it wouldn't be allowed to offer catch-ups for ever, ever, anyone? Or will those catch-ups be allowed to go to the pre-tax portion of the plan as before? We need guidance from the IRS on this. This is this is complex for sure. Secure 2.0 also says the mandatory Roth 401k catch-ups only applies to those whose wages exceed $145,000 as adjusted in the prior year. But many self-employed persons, including sole proprietors, don't have wages. Instead, they have business income. Does this mean that these business owners wouldn't be required to make catch-ups on a Roth basis, even if their income is over 145000 
Um, secure 2.0 glitches and unanswered questions remain. I think that's really interesting. Uh, just goes to show you that it gets more difficult every time something changes. And I, those changes happen quite a bit. All right. Uh, I really like this one. This is from my friend Andy, Andy Ives. Uh, he's an IRA analyst with the Slot Group. It's not just Ed, as I've told you. There's There are, uh, I guess, Sandy, uh, they Sandy, uh, Sarah, Andy, and um, Ian, and uh, they're really the core um, analyst group. So Andy writes, people on TikTok create investment advice videos, <laughs> and I'm supposed to trust whatever this talking head is telling me. No chance. Of course, the person on TikTok could hold a number of higher education degrees and financial certifications. But until I know for sure who they are, what, what they are talking about and what their objective is, I will keep my distance. Yes, and that goes along with uh, YouTube, too. There's a lot of YouTube gurus out there. And, I, and I'm aware of the fact that I'm saying that as you're watching this on YouTube. The internet cannot always be trusted. Artificial, I'm right here. Uh, the artif artificial intelligence creates bogus news articles, diluted people spew, uh, spew falsehoods, and bad actors intentionally create information anarchy. Indeed, having a healthy dose of skept skepticism can keep a person out of trouble. Believe only half of what you see and none of what you hear. Verify. Seek a trusted and knowledgeable third party to confirm or deny whatever information you just inhaled. Multiple resources must be consulted, especially with the important des decisions concerning retirement accounts or anything else for that matter. You know, I'm going to just add, add some editorial here. From time to time, um, you know, we, we, you all know that we'd like to keep our uh, practice um, boutique and relatively small. We typically only take on two clients a month and we, we work very deeply and intimately with our clients and their, for their um financial pro projections and their financial planning. Uh, and it's important that we um, that we do that thoroughly, but also leave time for our existing clients. And from time to time, we ha we even even after we onboard a client, we spend some time with him or her, it uh, it becomes obvious that it's not a good fit and we have to um, ask them to find some someplace else, somebody else to help them. And that that uh, occurred about a year ago. And 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 one of the issues, this wasn't the only thing, but one of the issues was this person was coming to us all the time with these things that that she was seeing on YouTube and other uh, channels that were really, really challenging um, and uh, not really legitimate, right? As far as investment options uh, and uh, and things like that. So one of them, what similar one is, is talked about in here. So be really careful where you get your investment advice and where you get your planning advice because um, it can it can. Um, it can cause some some challenges for you. So, um, un, uh, uh, Andy continues to write. Unfortunately, a heck of a lot of people follow a different mantra. If it's on the internet, it must be true. Such thought process is utterly foreign to me. But how else to explain what we're seeing? Actual court cases. So now let's talk about these court cases. So I'm right here, and this is one I've shared with you that when we have our um, slot updates, whether they're just information we receive on a regular basis, uh, you know, ma many times a week, almost daily from Ed and his group. Um, and we sit, we sit down and, and meet uh, for a day and a half or two days, um, twice a year with Ed and his group, you know, with a, I, I've shown you before the binder that we get with, with new updates and new court cases. And, and this is an example and the court cases are my favorite. So in the McNulty case, a Rhode Island nurse lost a chunk of her $400,000 nest egg when the tax court held that her self-directed IRA investment in gold coins that she kept in her position in her own house was a taxable distribution. While gold coins and gold bullion can be IRA investments, they must be held by a qualified trustee or custodian. Why did Mrs. McNulty think she could keep the coins at her home in a safe? The internet said so. In the text of the decision, Mrs. McNulty states she found the company offering the gold coins while doing internet research. I'm sure she saw glorious pictures of people with handfuls of gold coins clicking and tumbling through her fingertips. Their fingertips, he says. Um, so uh, some bad advice from the internet. So in another case here in the Lucas case from earlier this year, Robert Lucas was required to pay taxes and a 10% early distribution penalty on a $19,365 distribution from his 401k based on his own internet research and failed understanding of the 10% disability penalty exception. He claimed an exemption from taxes and penalty because of his diabetes. 
Yet Mr. Lucas was working a full-time job in the year of the distribution. The court ruled there there are degrees of disability and his diabetes diagnosis did not rise to the level necessary to qualify for the 10% exception. By relying on a financial website for information, he improperly concluded his diabetes qualified him as a disabled as disabled and that neither taxes nor the 10% penalty applied. So Lucas, from his own research, didn't just think that the 10% penalty didn't apply to him, and that's because he was under 59 and a half. And he said, you know, you can access your your IRAs for um, uh, a variety of reasons under 59 and a half, and, and permanent disability is one of them. Lucas did his internet research, and he, and he determined that by that research that his diabetes designation was was one and uh, to override the 10% penalty. But he went further and said, well, wait a minute, I don't even have to pay tax on this. Well, that's kind of crazy. But um, but this is the kind of stuff that people find. So Andy goes on to write just what bogus financial services website that Mr. Lucas stumbled upon and why did he trust it? What made Ms. Mrs. McNulty believe in the the bad actor who created the internet site and falsely claimed that she could keep her gold coins at home. Neither McNulty nor Lucas was being malicious. They were just gullible. I think humans, for the most part, are programmed to trust one another. But the internet is a cesspool. For every cute kitten, kitten video, there are probably 100 snakes. Be smart, be diligent, be aware of your surroundings. Knowledgeable, trustworthy people are re ready to guide you through the morass. Uh, seek them out and engage in thoughtful conversation before making any major decisions regarding your retirement account and otherwise. Good advice, Andy. Okay, let me come back. All right. No questions. Everybody's quiet today. All right, let's talk about the investment. So um, I, I think I've shared with you, but um, I'm going to share with you again, um, that uh, we recently hired a group out of... Um, the greater Philadelphia area and out by the main line uh, called Cornerstone Research to um, assist us in developing our portfolio structures and um, and even um, reba rebalancing our our client accounts and um, uh, conducting transactions for us. Uh, so after a, a long period of due diligence and um, with them, uh, we hired them in January, and um, they've they've slowly been integrating as part of our team, which is, it's it's been a very good addition. So um, this is not a situation where we farm out, you know, clients' money to um, to a third party investment firm. We we are still managing the investments. Um, we've just hired this um, this group of very very uh, qualified individuals, uh, chartered financial analysts, very uh, highly educated individuals. Um, uh, as uh, a research um, and and um, uh, implementation se segment of our firm, so um, with that they they do a weekly market commentary that I'm, that I've started to include in that cornerstone, and, and um, we're going to have a introduction webinar at some point. I think I shared with you that I wanted to make sure they were the right fit before I introduced them to you all, uh, and uh, certainly officially through a webinar rather than just discussion. All right, so um, Cornerstone wrote uh, about the uh, congressional testimony last week and where it read that uh, Chairman Powell seemed prepared to in increase the pace of rate hikes while also noting that the ultimate level of, and, and uh, the quotes, increased the pace of rate hikes while also noting that, in quotes, the ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be higher than previously anticipated. So that put a bit of a damper on the week. Um, and uh, Cornerstone writes that the Fed chief made it clear that a 50 basis point hike, so that's one half of 1%, is on the table for the March 21st and 22nd meeting, while also raising the po possibility that the end point may be closer to 6%, that's the target, um, than the, rather than the 5% the market had been expecting. So um, a lot of that has to do with jobs. We're going to talk about that. Now, um, considering what's happened with the banking industry since last week, uh, perhaps the Fed comes in at 0.25% instead of 0.50%, but yet to be seen, folks. But uh, there seems to be uh, some desire from the Fed to at least increase that again to 0.50%. And again, this has to do with the jobs and labor report. So the uh, job openings in January came in at 10.82 million, down uh, 410,000 from December, but there, there are, are at still a high, there's still a high 1.9 million or excuse me, 1.9 job openings per available worker. So almost two to one, two openings for every worker. Um, 
So the labor market remains extremely tight, but this number is lagging and quits declining. And quits declining indicates so quits are when people, you know, quit their job. Um, so there, there is a declining uh, quits uh, as well and the lowest level since May of 2021. So um, the declining number of um, the labor market and the two to one ratio for jobs for worker just again puts in this thought of, okay, well, the labor market is still very, very strong. We have to raise interest rates to help bring that down as well. Um, okay. We talked about the CPI already. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again with you, and we're just going to go over the markets from last week here. So you should see this in Vesco. Yes. Um, so just, just follow me here. The, um, I'm, I'm right here and th this, this shows the, uh, so Invesco sends this to me every week. I appreciate that from Invesco. Uh, we don't have any ties to Invesco. This is just research that I appreciate. Um, this shows the Dow Jones Industrial Average was down uh, 4.35 for the week, down 3.24 for the year. And year over year, so that's March 10th, 2022 to March 10th, 2023, down 1.71. You can see that the SP 500 was down last week, 4.51. NASDAQ was down 4.68. The MSCI World that's without the U.S. was down 1.17. The emerging markets was down 3.28. Everything, right? Everything was down last week. Some are still up for the year. Well, actually, the only one that's down for the year is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The SP 500 is actually up slightly, 0.91%. Probably much better today. The Nasdaq, all these, you know, all these are positive. Emerging markets, very, very slight. The reason I want to share this with you is to to bring your attention. Let me see if I can draw on this. I don't think I can. Yes, I can. Okay, so let me erase that. So follow me to the middle of the screen here, um, and I want to share. Let me make this a little larger. I just want to share with you this this number here: five point five zero five. Five point zero five. That's the six month U.S. Treasury. So what is a six month U.S. Treasury? That is a a bond that's issued by the federal government that matures six months from now. So that doesn't mean that you're receiving five percent in six months. That's an annualized six months. So call it two two point five. A little bit more than that. 2.025, I guess it would be. But um, this is what's really interesting and in what's happening right now. And um, and what I was talking about earlier, well, if you have a concern about your your um, your money being in the uh, bank and you're over the $250,000 level, you can certainly buy a six-month uh, uh, treasury bond. And there's, you know, this is fully backed by the federal government. So there's nothing safer out there. Um, the 30-day uh, or 90-day Treasury 90 day is about 4.8 yesterday when I looked at it. So these are really strong interest rates for very, very short term maturities. And of course, uh, and again, uh, if six months uh, matures in six months, then of course, 90 days matures in 90 days. Um, and that is also an annualized yield. Not um, That's not what you receive in 90 days. I only say that because people ask. But um, the importance of that is, look where we were a year ago. The six month is now 5.05. We're at 0.71 last year. The Fed funds target rate, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about raising rates. Let me just clear this up. was 0.25 a year ago. At year end, it was 4.50. Uh, as of the close of last week, it's 4.75. So that could increase another half a point or so. Um this increasing, these increasing rates on the short end, right? Six month, one year, two year treasuries at 4.59. You see how this is happening here? A 10 year treasury, let me just clean that up a little bit. 10 year treasury bond is 3.7%. A two year treasury bond is 4.59. I've said this before, but this is what we're talking about that inverted yield curve. And if you follow me over the top right of the screen here, You'll see that this uh, inverted, so my face is in the way a little bit there, so let me just move this. Um, you'll see that this this is this inverted yield curve, and this is where we were a year ago, and this looked like a normal year yield curve. Now today, this is where we are here, and you'll see that short-term rates are higher than longer-term rates. So who the heck would buy a 30-year bond that you're getting less than probably 3%? I don't have that number off the top of my head. Um, when you can get a 90-day bond or a six-month bond for 4.8 um, 4 to 5%. And that inverted yield curve, it you know, causes us concern about 
the uh, a, re a recession. That's a precursor to a recession. Um, and as I've said, if we're being honest, we're going to look back on this and say we've been in a recession since probably the um, the pandemic started. We've just been boosted up by inflows of cash. So I just wanted to share that with you. It's it's important to look at these market numbers over here, but this this is really what fascinates me. And uh, folks, let's let's go back to this side of the screen. Remember this. Barclays aggregate bond fund is where most people have their bond money. And most people, I'm doing air quotes. For those of you who are listening, I'm sorry, I'm I'm sharing. And you should, if you're listening to this, just listening to this, you should go to YouTube at some point and um, uh, see what I'm marking up on my screen because I'm sharing some uh, market data that's from Invesco. Uh, but you should see uh, exactly what I'm talking about there. So the... Um, Barclays aggregate bonds are where most investors hold most of their uh, bond holders holdings there in this three year. Some of them are longer term, but um, this is the, this is the ongoing problem is that that's air quotes. That is supposed to be your air quote safe money. Right. Um, but uh, that hasn't been very safe over the past year. So it's getting better, right? We're up about 1% here. Um, but um Still a concern, and I see people shaking their head all the time when 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 I'm talking to them and when they're in their classes. And again, we we were very fortunate last year not to have that problem. But um, you know, one of the and let me go jump back to Cornerstone. One of the reasons that we I decided to hire Cornerstone is that I shared with you that going forward in the markets, the investment markets uh, in the next one, three, or five years is going to be maybe the most challenging that we've experienced. It's been a pretty easy ride over the last 15 years. I think you would all have to agree with that. Um, the markets have been efficient. Um, I don't know I don't know what it's going to look like over the next one to three to five years, but I think it's going to be pretty tough going. So that was one of the reasons that we wanted to bring on this, um, you know, this highest level of expertise and another, um, a, a really another resource for us. Again, not farming it out to anybody. I don't, I don't, um, I, I haven't, I'm not against that. I just, I just haven't found a satisfactory option for that. Um, but in this case of hiring Cornerstone as part of our team, um, we can, we can, enact some of the some of the investment theses that we have around you know protecting the downside giving us some gains um, uh, even if it's dividend growth um, during these difficult times and certainly our segmentation process which is um, which the vast majority of people don't do so um, that's one of the reasons also that we engage cornerstone so let me stop sharing my screen here and we're going to wrap it up um, on in the markets here in a second um, Wall Street Journal talked more about the SVB collapse um, and Signature Bank, right? Uh, and they talked about um, how the U.S. government's going to bail. Uh, how it seems to be bailing, you know, saying we're going to we're going to bail everybody out, and backstop this. Don't worry about your deposits. Now, what's yet to be determined is what that looks like. Um, there's some emergency orders that can happen, but really the um, Congress is going to have to get involved and say, uh, "Okay, Fed, uh, Federal Reserve, and." Um, FDIC, this is what's this is what's going to look like. Honestly, the FDIC should be raised significantly. It was uh, prior to the the, the uh, Great Recession, it was a hundred thousand dollars, if you remember, and then it was raised to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That should probably be closer to a million dollars. The problem is, of course, that the FDIC um, insurance is really insurance that's every depositor is paid in pays into. It's a quasi-government organization, and they they pay into this insurance policy, and uh, it can take years, by the way, to get your money back out of the FDIC. But um, the if they raise the limits to a million dollars, let's just say, well, the insurance premiums are going to go up, so it's going to be more ca costly for the for the banks. So um, that was uh, at the BlackRock was talking about um, stock earnings, and they write stocks are starting to reflect the economic damage from higher rates, and we see more hikes due to sticky inflation and jobs, as we talked about. But expected earnings still look rosy to us, they say. So they they're liking um, stocks a bit now. They're telling us uh, we already know this because we went over it. U.S. stocks fell over 4% last week and erased most of their gains for the year, partly after the Fed officials made clear they would step up the pace of rate hikes. Um, this week's U.S. inflation report will be a critical gauge before the Fed's next policy meeting. The European Central Bank is likely to raise rates by 50 or 0.5%. Uh, um, 
I was about to say 50 basis points, not 50%. So that means the same thing, 0.5%. Um, so we know now that um, the inflation came in as expected, but I still believe we're going to see an aggressive raise by the Fed. Um, it could be different now. They could say 0.25%, but my expectation is they come in at one half of 1%. All right. Um, okay, we do have a question. Walter asks, um, can you buy individual treasuries inside of an IRA? Great question, Walter. Yes, uh, yes, yes, of course you can. And uh, Walter says not bond funds. And that's Walter's right there. So I wouldn't necessarily be buying bond funds right now um, if, if, you're, if your goal is short-term um, protection. Because uh, as interest rates increase, bonds are likely to come down. Now, a lot of that, a lot of that damage was done last year, so we're starting on the longer and not even on the longer end, but even in the midterm term end, um, you know, plus three years, four, five, six years and out, um, we're starting to implement bond holdings uh, via ETF, exchange traded funds. Um, and uh, in some cases, uh, potentially mutual funds. But that's a really great question, uh, Walter. And yes, you can buy individual treasuries inside an IRA. Good question. Um, let's see. Where am I going? Whiteboard. Whiteboard time. Okay. So here's our financial planning topic of the day. You're not seeing me. You're not. You're just seeing me. So let me switch over to me and my Surface Pro. And I'm going to be looking down here, but this is our financial planning topic of the day. And the topic of the day is Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks. And this isn't, what, what today's discussion isn't is, should it be Roth IRA or should it be Roth 401k? We're just going to talk about some of the basics because these things confuse some people. So this is part of the video where um, we we uh, split off another video. So if you're just watching this on YouTube, I'm going to ask you again. You, you can like, subscribe, and hit the notification button so that you're always notified of our updated um Videos and uh, this is a section when, when we're just spinning off the last 15 minutes or so of our uh, weekly webinar. We're, we're calling this the financial 15. So you might see that, um, the, you know, 15 minutes to make changes in your retirement plan. So we want to give people an opportunity to go in and, and look at these segments and really learn something. And some of you want to be updated with all that stuff we talk about before here, you know, the the um, the market updates and those, I think, very, very valuable updates from the slot group that we just went over. And if you're just catching this and you want to learn more about what happened in the markets last week and what our thoughts are about the uh, market analyses and, and go over some of these um, retirement distribution pitfalls and things to watch out for and the things we learned from other people's mistakes, really, and updates from the best um, IRA group in the country, uh, then go back and watch uh, the rest of the webinar. But otherwise, we're going to dive into the Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks. Hopefully, I keep it together here and I'm going to move this down so you should all be able to see um, see my screen. I'll come back to that question I see here. So um, we're going to talk about Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks. So let's first talk about the Roth IRA. And uh, I'm going to bring in, let's see, I've got this chart over here. So you can, everybody can download these charts from our website. And um, uh, they, I still have the 2022 charts up, which I'm, I tend to keep up until, um, well, pretty, pretty soon to now, uh, probably mid April because people are still doing tax planning around, um, around the 2022 numbers, but, uh, but soon we'll switch that over to 2023, but you can, this is the retirement plan contribution limit chart. Let me just move the service so we can see everything together. And the first thing we're going to talk about in the Roth IRA. Now, remember, IRAs and retirement plans are different. And when I'm talking about IRAs, I'm talking about individual retirement accounts. When you think about 401ks, 403b, simple plans, SEP IRAs, they're really retirement plans. The SEP IRA kind of runs the course of both. But um, certainly 401ks, 403bs, simple IRAs, they are retirement plans. And although they may act similarly, right? Whether it's traditional and you pay tax later or the Roth and you pay tax now and don't pay tax later, they are different and they have different rules. You've got to be very, very careful about that. All right. Um, so 
With Roth IRAs, we have contribution limits. So there's a limit on the amount that you can contrib contribute every year. And we're going to zoom in and see what they are right here. So these are IRA and Roth IRA contribution limits. And in 2023, you can see right here, your maximum contribution to a Roth IRA or, or a traditional IRA for that matter, but we're focusing on Roth today is $6,500 if you're, if you're under 50 years old. And once you cross that lovely uh, threshold of 50, and it is lovely, you can add another $1,000 for a total of $7,500. That is the contribution limit. There, however, with a Roth IRA, there are phase-out limits. So what the heck does that mean? That means if you make too much money, you can't contribute to a Roth IRA. And yes, you can still do backdoor Roth IRA contributions if you're above this. And I have a video about that. If you search our library, I focus just on uh, backdoor Roth IRAs. A few, I want to say a few weeks ago, it could have been a few months ago. I don't know. But these are the current 2023, again, phase out levels. Now, um, if you make uh, $218,000, that's modified adjusted gross income, then there's a trigger there. And you can, and in this, in this $10,000 here, you can contribute less and less and less into your Roth IRA until once you're over $228,000, you can, uh, you're at zero, zero for your contributions to your Roth IRA. So these are the Roth IRA phase out levels. So if you make too much money, you can't contribute to a Roth IRA. And of course, for single filers, it's worse because you really get slammed as a single filer. Your phase outs are 138,000, modified adjusted gross income to $153,000. So again, it starts to winnow down at 138,000. And um, once you hit $153,000, you can't contribute to anything. Now, so we talked about income, oops, uh, contribution amount. We talked about income that again, we're under the Roth IRA here. Income uh, phase out levels, right? If you make too much money, you can't uh, contribute to the Roth um, and what those phase out levels are. Um, the, there's an income requirement to have a Roth, to contribute to a Roth. I, and we're talking about contributions here. We're not talking about conversions. Conversions are a different thing. But, um, and I'm, I'm going to write a note here. So I can touch on that. Um there is uh, an income requirement for contributions, not for conversions. That means you have to have um, earned income to be able to contribute to your Roth IRA. So conversion income doesn't count. People, people think, you know, if I, if I have taxable income, does that, does that matter? No, it has to be earned income. So um, passive income doesn't count. Pension income doesn't count. Uh, unemployment um, no, I don't think unemployment counts, but if you have a question about that, um, uh, uh, deferred comp can, uh, depending how it's structured. So deferred compensation. Uh, so, or certainly, um, um, certainly if you take a package and you're paid out like a, like a retirement package and you're paid out over, over a period of time, um, that can be considered, um, earned income. So uh, the income requirement isn't crystal clear. Um, it, it, it's crystal clear on the rules, but it's not, uh, it's not logical always. So if you have questions about the income requirement, you can ask. Contribution timing. So it's got to be by the tax filing deadline. Tax filing deadline for each year, it's April 18th this year, which means that you can make, you can still make a 2022 Roth IRA contribution if you meet all those requirements. You have earned income. Um, you're not above the phase out levels. Um, you can still make a contribution for 2022 and then you can still, you could do it also a contribution for 2023, of course, right now. Invest, investment options. So Andy, one of the, I think it was Andy was talking about, you know, yes, you can buy gold in your IRA and even individual gold and you can buy hard assets and things like that. There are some things you can't buy. I think antiquities you can't buy in a, um, uh, in a Roth, but really anything that you can purchase in a traditional IRA you can purchase in a Roth IRA. Um, I get this question a lot. Well, you're recommending a Roth conversion, but what can I expect to earn in that Roth? Well, you're going to earn whatever your investments earn, and you're, inve you're, you're, you're probably going to invest the same way in your Roth as you did in your traditional IRA using the same instruments, I mean. 
you you may invest differently, but um, but any investments that you can choose in a traditional IRA, stocks, bonds, cash, mutual funds, uh, ETFs, exchange traded funds, um, CDs, annuities, you know, any anything that you can that you can invest in in a traditional IRA, you can invest in a Roth IRA. There is a five year rule in that Roth IRA, so the five year rule says that you you've got to be over fifty nine and a half and have own a Roth IRA for at least five years before any growth or gains are the, uh, able to come out tax-free. You've heard me say that these uh, this five-year rule can be very confusing and very difficult, under 59 and a half, but it's very, very simple, over 59 and a half. Uh, I think I did a, a video about that, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because we're comparing the Roth IRA and the Roth 401k, but there is a five-year rule in the Roth IRA. And of course, there is no RMDs. There are no RMDs with the Roth um, IRA for your own Roth IRA. If you pass it to your beneficiaries, there are. We're going to talk about that. But um, uh, but there is no required minimum distribution. So a traditional IRA, if you have a million dollars in there, your first year RMD, if you turn 73 today, would be 30, about $37,000. But um, with, and let's just say you only need 20. Well, the IRS is still going to require you to take out that $37,000 and pay tax on it, of course. With the uh, Roth IRA, there's no RMD. So if you want $20,000, you can take $20,000 out of there. If you only want $10,000, you can take $10,000. If you want to take your whole $37,000 out of there and spend it, you can. And of course, there's no tax on any of this as long as you meet that five year rule. And you pass. So not only is uh, a properly timed and structured Roth IRA uh, tax free uh, for you, but you pass to your beneficiaries, obviously zero tax. Um, there can be RMDs if you pass it to your beneficiaries. So remember, if you've already hit your, uh, oh no, excuse me. No, no, no. Uh, with a Roth IRA, there are no RMDs. Uh, scratch that um, for uh, inherited um, beneficiaries. It has to be depleted by the end of the 10th year. Um, and of course, zero tax. So you've got your 10-year rule. Glad I caught myself on that. Okay, so that is a Roth IRA. I hope that all makes sense. Roth IRA. Now let's talk about one of my favorite options here, and that's the Roth 401k. So I'm going to move this down here so we can see this. And let me clear, let me clear some of this. What's going on here? Uh, okay, we're just going to draw over it because it's it's getting all wonky, as they say. All right. Um, all right, so the Roth 401k, here's your contribution amount for your 401k. Let's first talk about contribution amount. So I'm over here. Stop moving around. I'm going to make this a little larger. There we go. So here are our salary deferrals. So we contribute to retirement plans, not by writing a check and deposit, but it has to come out of your salary deferrals, right? So um, you can't just say at the end of the year, unless you have some time and you've got enough income, you can't just say, hey, deposit $30,000 into my 401k. You really have to plan that throughout the year. Now, some people will get to the end of the year, say the, the third quarter of the year, and they say, oh, I didn't put enough in. And now can you increase... Um, can you increase my contribution to the 401k? Now you've got to do a calculation to see if you can get the maximum amount in there. And you might be giving up all of your income for the rest of the year to uh, the contribution into the 401k. So that is done via salary deferrals. So what are the limits for 2023? Um, it, under 50 years old, it's 22,500. If you're over 50, it's $7,500 for a total of $30,000. Now that's a significant amount of money that you can put into a retirement account, $30,000. And you think if you're, you and your spouse are both employed and you both have a Roth 401k option, then you could be putting up to $60,000 a year away and you'll never pay tax on the growth of that money again. Again, there is a five-year rule. We're going to talk about that with a Roth uh, 401k or Roth 403b. Remember, this isn't just 401ks. This is a 403b. So these are really valuable. If for some reason your employer doesn't have one of these yet, Encourage your employer to, ha to to develop one. They're not that expensive. To if you already have a four hundred one k, the four hundred three b is really a non issue. It's just an amendment to your documents, and it really should be included. Even the four hundred three b. You know, when I was a uh, school board member, 
at Council Rock, we had a 403B plan, not for us, but for the employees. So the employees had a 403B with a Roth option, and that should be commonplace these days. Now, there are the contribution limits. Let's slide back over here. So here are the contribution amounts you're allowed to do. Your income requirements, of course, are still there because they have to be payroll deduction. So what about the income phase-out level? Remember, we talked about the Roth IRA. It's actually, it's, it's actually right here, these phase-out levels. If you make too much money, you can't contribute to a Roth IRA. But that doesn't exist. I'm going to make this red because it's more dramatic. That doesn't exist in the Roth 401k. So the Roth 401k, you can make as much money as you'd like or as you can. You can make a million dollars in a year and still be able to contribute to a Roth 401k. I hope you see the value in that because if you make too much money, you can't contribute to a Roth IRA. But if you make over these, these phase-out levels, if you make $230,000 a year, you can still contribute to your Roth 401k. That's why it's, it's why you, if you have, I'm going to say it again, if you have a 401k plan, but you don't have a Roth option, encourage your employer. If you're self-employed, do it yourself. Contribution timing. I talked about that has to be done really throughout the year because it's payroll deduction. So you've got a plan for this. You got to make sure it's right. Folks, I will share with you that this weekend I was going over our 401k or company 401k with my wife and I. So my wife's an employee. She has a 401k here. I have a 401k here. I was checking the contributions to make sure that we were maximizing our contributions um, because the the um, the snapshot on the on the screen said one thing, but the contribution said another. So just like you, uh, I need to check my 401k from time to time and make sure everything is working right. Investment options are a little different. You typically can't invest in anything you want. You get a menu of different investment options from the 401k provider, and you make a choice. You make a choice of what those investments are. Now, with some 401k providers, you can pay a fee to a manager to help you manage those 401ks, but typically you're responsible for making those decisions. Um, they're also under the new, this is new. I'll come back to the five-year rule. I'm just going to highlight this. This is new. Um, there are no RMDs now from a 401k. Now that is new as of two months ago when the Secure Act 2.0 came out. It used to be that there were RMDs required from a 401k. Now that was erased. Um, you pass the beneficiaries the same way. So the same way that um, uh the 401k is tax free, follows the same rules. Um, the there, there actually can be a couple of hiccups along the way with a retirement plan. So often it's better to roll that into a inherited IRA and deal with it that way. But um, be careful about this, this, uh, this section here. Uh, the five year rule is very, very similar to um, uh, to the Roth IRA five year rule. However, um, it can be a little trickier. So, um, we can, uh, maybe we'll do a, a webinar about the five-year rules with someone from the slot group. So um, let's see if I covered everything. The moral of the story is the 401ks, let's see how how small I can make this, but still readable. I'd, I'd love to do a fancy move and put, slide this up to the side, but I, I, I'm afraid that it's not going to go well. Um, the, the moral of the story is Roth 401ks, Roth IRAs are very valuable. And yes, by the way, you can do both. So if you're under, let's say your adjusted gross income is um, under this phase out level, right? Uh, you're a married couple and you come in at $210,000. You're a married couple and your modified uh, adjusted gross income is $210,000. For an example, you can contribute 100%, you know, uh, up to the max into your um, 401k, and you can contribute $7,500 and $7,500 in your Roth IRA. Um, so a lot of people also believe that you got to do one or the other. You can't do both. You can absolutely do both. You have to pay attention to these phase-out levels. Very, very important because, again, that applies to the Roth. The phase-out level does not apply to the 401k. That is huge. So it's not really one or the other. Ideally, use both if you can. Um, if you can't, uh, if you can only uh, contribute to one and you're a high income earner, you might want to look at the Roth 401k. Um, but uh, again, you got to make sure that you've got one in place, of course, um, and, uh, and whatnot. Now, uh, I wrote up here for, to remind myself this. It's a little small now. I wrote conversions. You remember. 
So conversions are, um, just to remind you, here's your tax-free bucket, or excuse me, tax-deferred uh, bucket, and here's your tax-free or tax-advantage bucket. Conversions are a tool that allows us to move money. So you've got you've got uh, lots of money here. It allows us to move money from this bucket to this bucket. Um, you pay tax along the way. Taxes due on the conversion. And then if you meet all the requirements, basically the five-year rule, 0% tax on distribution. So the IRS allows us to convert as little or as much as we'd like to. Um, that's a, you, You've heard me say that's a real gift. They could be very restrictive. They could put guidelines in, but they say you can convert all this or you can convert a little bit of it or any portion in between that you'd like. The only thing you have to do is pay tax. So that is really easy with an IRA. You determine how much you want to pay. You figure out what your tax rate, what tax rate you want to be at or you need to be at. And then you figure out the amount that switches over from tax deferred to tax free. Um, that's with an IRA. A Roth 401k is a little differently. Um, so here's tax deferred 401k. And you've got your tax advantaged or tax free. So even if you have uh, a 401k, Roth 401k option, and you've got lots of money over here. Now, the IRS says you can convert it, but you have this thing called a plan sponsor or a plan custodian. The The documents might say, no, uh, -uh don't allow for any conversions. They can put up a roadblock here that says, nope, can't do that because they don't want to keep track of the paperwork and all that stuff. And sometimes they say, okay, you can do that, but you only get one. Very, very rarely do I see that they'll allow some great flexibility to be able to do meaningful conversions over time. So that is an area where Roth IRAs are, or excuse me, yes, Roth IRAs are uh, superior in my, in my opinion than Roth 401ks only because of the flexibility uh, regarding conversions. All right. I hope that was helpful. So we went over the, uh, the uh, slot uh, report. We went over some market updates. We went over the difference between the basic difference between Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks. Um, this is uh, really confusing stuff. I know. I hope I've made it a little simpler for you. We have a couple questions. So let's see. Laxman writes, why aren't the banks competing with the treasuries in terms of offering higher rates? Let me come off of my screen share. Uh, so why aren't the banks competing with the treasury in terms of offering higher interest rates? Well, they are in to some degree. So you, you can find CDs that are that are probably plus three percent. Um, I think the banks are um, they have to make money, right? Um, and uh, that's really not the issue. The issue is is that the this the the perception or the comfort of safety uh, in the in the U.S. Gov government notes compared to the FDIC limits of the bank. But good question. Uh, Michael asks, Roth contribution limit if only one spouse has earned income. Great question. Um, if only one spouse has um, earned income, you can still do 7,500. You have to earn at least this amount, right, um, with uh, perhaps a bit more. But you can do a spousal contribution if – so if uh, if – if I was unemployed and my wife was working only and she earned $20,000 a year, uh, as an example, well, you might think that, well, she could do a Roth contribution, but I can't do a Roth contribution. But the law allows for a spousal contribution. So if if we wanted to, she could do a $7,500 contribution for herself. She could do a $7,500 contribution for me. I only say $7,500 because we're both over 50 uh, under 50, you see the limits here, uh, $6,500 for 2023. And I realize that you can't see my screen right now. Um, Laxman also asks, uh, what about income from an LLC toward a Roth IRA contribution? Uh, what about income from an LLC? Oh, the business income from your LLC? Yeah, that would count. Uh, for an IRA contribution, uh, depending on the structure, I suppose there could be a question there, but it should, it should, uh, it should count. Uh, Walter says Roth 401k has RMD. Uh, it did, uh, but not, not anymore, Walter. Um, so up until the secure act, which was just a few weeks ago, um, there was an RMD required from a Roth 401k. Of course you didn't pay tax on that RMD. 
but it was still something that needed to be taken. Um, and again, you got to be careful. Retirement plans are different than IRAs and their rules are different. All right, folks, it is uh, the end of our hour here. Um, I hope this was all helpful. I appreciate your attention and your your time. Please remember to like, subscribe, and uh, hit that notification button. And you know, share this with your friends. If you think this is beneficial, share it with your friends. If you want to come by our class, uh, particularly on Tuesdays and Thursday, we have some room coming up at Holy Family. Uh, as I said, Saturday's getting a little full, but um, we'd love to see you. Look out for our upcoming events, and we'll talk to you next week. Have a great week. Take care.